So the fact that you know what this is tells us a lot about how things have changed during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, prior to 2020, if you ask someone to describe indoor air quality, they would use things like, talk about things like relative humidity, temperature, that kind of thing. Um, nobody would talk about CO2. And why would you? Um, you don't feel CO2. You go and walk into a room and goes, wow, the CO2 in this room is tremendously high. Um, but yeah, the global pandemic has a way of changing your perception of things. So um, what I'm going to be talking about in this video is essentially how CO2 affects the transmission of SARS-CoV-2. And by better understanding the dynamics at play, I think you can use this information to help protect yourself from being, you know, catching SARS-CoV-2. In order for SARS-CoV-2 to be transmitted through the air, an infected person needs to exhale infectious aerosol that is then transported and inhaled by a healthy individual. If the healthy person is in the exhalation plume, they'll be exposed to the highest dose of infectious aerosol. This means that mitigation techniques like filtration and ventilation will have little to no effect since they are unable to affect the exposure over such a short distance. This is another reason why masking is so important since it physically lowers the dose within the plume. Now, if the healthy individual is beyond the plume, then many other factors really begin to matter. For example, over time, the amount of infectious aerosol can accumulate. Thus, understanding how aerosolized viral load changes over time becomes very important when estimating risk. In order to figure out how much infectious aerosol has accumulated in a space, we can use the CO2 monitor in three different ways. First, we can use it to estimate how much aerosol has actually been exhaled into the space. We can use it to estimate how well that aerosol is being physically removed from the space. And third, we can use it to understand essentially how fast the air virus itself is losing its infectivity over time. Every breath, a person will exhale both CO2 and aerosol. Thus, it's reasonable to assume that the amount of CO2 exhaled ought to correlate with the amount of aerosol that is also exhaled. But is this true? Well, when you measure the amount of CO2 a person exhales, it essentially is a function of activity, where the higher the activity level, the higher the amount of CO2 that is exhaled. Similarly, the amount of aerosol exhaled also increases with activity. This means that the CO2 concentration will track very well with the amount of exhaled aerosol in silence. When people begin to sing or talk, the amount of aerosol they produce will change dramatically. And the louder a person speaks or sings, the higher amount of aerosol that is exhaled. Now, when people have looked beyond aerosol counts and measured the amount of infectious virus in the aerosol, this exact trend was also observed. This confirms the theory that aerosol counts correlate very well with infectious viral load. All right. All right, so CO2 is a decent indicator for how much aerosol has been exhaled in a given space when people are quiet. So places like a library, movie theater, maybe a gym. Now, when people begin to speak, this relationship breaks down, but it breaks down in one direction. And so what this means is that the CO2 concentration really is a good indicator of like the minimum amount of exhaled aerosol in a given space. Now, given that SARS-CoV-2 is airborne, um, one way we can limit transmission is through ventilation, basically physically removing the aerosol from the space. Now these, these are outstanding at helping us understand ventilation. So the assumption is that both infectious aerosol and CO2 originate from the same source and thus are connected. There are two ways in which airborne viruses are physically removed from the air. One way is that the virus-containing aerosol can be removed by passing the air through a filter. While this effectively removes the aerosol, filtering the air does nothing to change the CO2 concentration. So when filtration is used, then the perceived risk indicated by the CO2 concentration may be much higher than the actual risk. For example, people commonly report high concentrations of CO2 on airplanes. Since the air is heavily filtered on an airplane, the amount of infectious aerosol will be far lower than the CO2 monitor suggests. All right, so the other way in which infectious aerosol is physically removed from the air is through ventilation. So things like opening a window or a door, CO2 monitors are excellent at measuring how well a room is ventilated. Consider the following example. 
When a person enters a room, their exhaled CO2 will begin to fill it. The concentration of CO2 won't increase linearly. Rather, it'll eventually reach something called a steady state. This occurs since the amount of CO2 that's exhaled will equilibrate with the amount that diffuses from the room through the various cracks, doors, and vents. Note that the rate that the CO2 diffuses from the room will depend on its concentration. So the higher the concentration, the higher the diffusion rate. This is why a steady state is reached and the CO2 doesn't just simply increase in concentration forever. Now, if a second person enters the room, the concentration of the CO2 will again increase, reaching a new, higher steady state. This trend will continue as more and more people enter the room. Now, if the ventilation rate is changed, a new steady state will be reached. The ventilation rate is reported as the air exchanges per hour. And the higher the exchange rate, ACH for short, the lower the maximum CO2 and thus the lower the amount of infectious aerosol in the room. Building regulations will have a minimum ACH. In the UK, it's four, but it may be different in your country. Here's the thing. While an average ACH for a building is set, it may not be accurate at every location. For example, cubicles, false walls, furniture, all can negatively affect how well the engineered ventilated space works. This can lead to areas that have wildly different ventilation rates, even though the building itself is up to code. You can use a CO2 monitor to get an idea of the ventilation rate in a room by simply using this equation. I'll walk you through it with an example. Let's say you put a CO2 monitor in a room and leave. The change in the CO2 over time will look something like this. C start is the CO2 concentration when the room is first emptied. C end is the CO2 concentration after a period of time. C baseline is the CO2 concentration outside. And T hours is the time in hours that the measurement is made. If you use the numbers provided here and put them into the equation, you get an ACH of 0 0.4, which is not very good at all. So you can do this quite easily yourself at home. If the ACH is less than four, that means the space is underventilated and the higher the value, the better ventilated your room is. In short, CO2 monitors are outstanding at helping you understand the ventilation dynamics in your living space. So when you look at the CO2 concentration, and the rate in which the CO2 concentration changes, you have a very good idea of how much aerosol has been exhaled into the space and how effectively that aerosol is being physically removed from the space. This is excellent for helping us estimate risk. But here's the thing, the CO2 concentration actually gives us even more information because CO2 affects how long SARS-CoV-2 remains infectious in the air. SARS-CoV-2 is transmitted through the air on exhaled aerosol. The composition of respiratory aerosol and how it changes over time will dictate how long a virus remains infectious. Now, a respiratory fluid is a complex mixture of proteins, sugars, and salts, and dissolves CO2 in the form of bicarbonate. Now, CO2 is a product of metabolism, and the body uses it to regulate the pH of various fluids, such as blood. It's one of the reasons why we breathe. When exhaled, aerosol made from respiratory fluid will begin to lose the bicarbonate in the form of CO2. And for every CO2 molecule that leaves the droplet, a single molecule of acid is also removed. Shown here is the chemical reaction that occurs. It's this loss of acid that results in the pH of the aerosol increasing dramatically. Precisely how high and how fast is still a subject of intense debate. That said, what is clear is that based on the amount of bicarbonate in the starting solution, the respiratory aerosol will reach a pH greater than 10. And it's this high pH that seems to drive the loss of infectivity of SARS-CoV-2. This means that anything that affects the high pH of the aerosol will affect the rate of decay. Specifically, if the CO2 in the room is higher, less CO2 will leave the aerosol, resulting in less acid leaving the aerosol. As a result, the pH of the aerosol won't get as high and less virus will be inactivated. Now, as little as 800 ppm CO2, which is thought to be pretty well ventilated, is actually enough to affect the air stability of SARS-CoV-2. Consider this. In clean air, over 97% of SARS-CoV-2 decays in 40 minutes. Now, if the concentration of CO2 is increased to just 3,000 ppm, which is the level commonly reported in UK schools, the decay rate changes dramatically. After 40 minutes, 
almost 30% of initial uh, infectious dose is still present. Moreover, the rate of decay of this fraction is exceedingly slow. Stabilization of the virus means that the infectious viral load in the room will begin to greatly accumulate, significantly increasing the risk of transmission. All right, so what does this mean and what can we do with it? Well, if the CO2 concentration is low, say four or 500 ppm CO2, that means that not a lot of aerosol has been exhaled into the space, uh, and any aerosol that has is being effectively removed physically from the space, and biologically the virus is decaying faster under those conditions. Now as the CO2 concentration goes up, obviously there's evidence of more exhaled aerosol, but also the aerosol is being less effectively removed, and the, obviously the virus itself is living longer under those conditions. And so really, the CO2 concentration gives you an excellent indicator of long-distance transmission risk of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I am convinced that the popularity of CO2 monitors will have one of the largest impacts um, of the COVID-19 pandemic moving forward because it's really changed how people think about indoor air quality in a very profound way. Yeah. So um, with that, if you have any questions, uh, please leave them in the comments or ask me on Blue Sky or Twitter. And uh, yeah, with that, um, well, Mix has all the uh, references that I used in the, uh, in the video, so yeah, check it out.